This is an interview for week three or session three of the course AEDT 1120U Foundations of Digital Teaching and Learning Technologies. And we're here with uh, the TA for the course, Katie Flynn, and uh, I, of course, am uh, Dr. Roland Van Osfein, the professor of this course itself. Uh, Katie's going to start off with a couple of questions or a number of questions, and I'm going to respond, and then uh, Katie and I are going to enter into an exchange of uh, views as we're going along. Go ahead, Katie. So, Ron, my first, so Ron, question, first question, is, question is, what is the relationship is the between learning between and the affordances, affordances that are available, that are available when, digital when digital technologies are used? Great question. And uh, one of the things that I should say is that uh, the question is, itself is derived to a certain extent from the conversations that we've been having inside of our tutorial sessions as we go along. Anyway, so I'm going to start with uh, dissecting this question and uh, the questions you can see are on the screen as well. Um, so the relationship between learning and the affordances that are available when digital technologies are used. So first of all, we need to have a pretty good understanding of what we mean by learning. And uh, my references for learning have everything to do with Piagetian and Vygotskyan kinds of uh, definitions for learning. And I'll start with Piaget. Um, from the perspective that he, he took very much a cognitive kind of stance with respect to learning um, as compared to anything that you may have come across from old oh, people like um, B.F. Skinner, for instance, other kinds of uh, behaviorists. So what behaviorists basically are doing is saying that if you give a stimulus to an individual, you will get a certain kind of response. So the question is making sure that the stimulus and response are appropriate to each other so that you can end up with the right kinds of responses at the right kinds of times. That places some constraints on learning so that only those pieces that can actually count as um, responses to a stimulus actually count as learning. Well, my learning has an awful lot more to do with a, a number of things, that, including um, what is thinking and what is going to stimulate thinking and how can we actually get people to actually think more about whatever they want um, rather than uh, just thinking about things that uh, are going to be presented to them in terms of a stimulus. So um, basically what I come down to is that learning is a, uh, a process of changing cognitive structures structures that you have already got in your mind and these would be referred to as schema. So schema would be cognitive structures or ways of looking at things um, that you have developed over time because of an interplay between yourself and the environment with, within which you live. So that's what I mean by learning. So we can change that, those learnings by uh, experiencing new um, new kinds of events that uh, we haven't come across before and that will cause us to either uh, add those things to our list of experiences the and uh, they don't have significant changes um, to the schema other than expand uh, their poss the possibilities that are um, available or there are times when we come across things where you know the figurative light bulb goes on and those are places where we are actually changing the schema that we have in our heads. We are changing the order. We are changing the, um, the, the, the understandings that we have within our own heads that uh, signify that we are changing the schema in some way, shape, or form. And these, both of these processes, the adding on to existing structures and modifying the existing structures, um, are referred to by the terminology um, assimilation and accommodation. And uh, I'll leave the, those with you um, so you can go and take a look at uh, what Piaget meant with both of those. Now, affordances that are available when you're dealing with digital technologies. Affordances are things like tools or the abilities. They, they give you the ability to do certain kinds of things. So affordances that are available with digital technologies can come in a number of different kinds of shapes and sizes. One of the most uh, apparent affordances that becomes available with digital technologies is just doing the, the, the kind of thing of taking the, the audible word and changing it into text. 
So we can actually put text onto the screen and then we can manipulate the text in a number of different ways. So that's an affordance that's available with digital technologies. Did you want to respond to any of that uh, material so far with um, anything that you have, Katie? No, I just think looking forward, it's going to be interesting if we're defining um, learning in this way and to how we're going to be defining um, assessment. Right. Uh, I'm not even going to touch the assessment piece at this point in time because we're still just learning with uh, dealing with the learning. Um, so the affordances that are available and um, what they can do with your learning, well, there's a number of different possibilities that we're going to be looking at um, in coming weeks. Um, that is the second part of this course where we specifically look at what is the computer uh, capable of doing and then what are those um, affordances or those, those competencies that the computer has that uh, we can make use of as human beings. And underlying all of this is the whole idea that we're always going to be looking for how does this enable us to change the structures that we have within our head. And I'll give you one more reference here. Um, if you want to, to take a look at Benjamin Bloom's material, um, what Benjamin Bloom came up with was a taxonomy or a listing of criteria in terms of the way that we can look at kinds of learning. So he starts off uh, at the bottom level of his, uh, and if you take a look at this in, in Wikipedia, his taxonomy starts on the bottom level with things like memory. So memory is obviously very, very important. It's uh, a basic skill according to um, the kinds of things that uh, Bloom was talking about, but it's at the bottom level. So learning has more to do with a whole bunch of other things in addition to memory. Um, so what are the top top of the, uh, the scale for uh, Bloom in his taxonomy? Things like analysis, synthesis, evaluation, creation of new ideas, etc., etc. So it's the higher order thinking skills that we're always going to be looking for, uh, particularly when we use digital technologies and uh, how they can actually influence learning. So Roland, I think that the next yeah. question is maybe to explain a little further about what is a PBL and what are learners supposed to do in a PBL setting? Okay, this is actually kind of an interesting question from the perspective that I deal with it in an entire course um, on Fridays. But uh, to a large extent, what we're looking at here is um, how is this particular course going to be different from anything that you've ex uh, experienced before? And let me try uh, a different set of analogies perhaps than the ones that I've already tried in the, the video clip um, in um, session one. Um, the, the idea that uh, tr most traditional uh, education goes under is that you have to learn the basic skills before you can go on to apply them. Um, and usually what's meant in terms of learn in this particular instance is this whole idea that you have to be able to be exposed to these ideas and you have to memorize them so that they're available um, sort of at your, your cognitive fingertips so that you can apply them to new situations and, and new applications uh, when you come across them. Um, PBL isn't like that at all. PBL takes a look at it from the perspective that we um, are going to be set problems that uh, we are going to find in situations and in uh, contexts that are presented to us and then we are expected to figure out for ourselves what is the actual problem, what are the um, required pieces of knowledge and resources that need to be applied to those particular uh, problems first to understand them and then secondly to come up with solutions for those problems and then to create the solutions that are necessary. So it really ch changes the whole dynamic of what learning is all about. And instead of preloading the learning into a student, if there was any way of doing that, um, you end up giving the students the ability, the opportunities to learn for themselves as they're going through. But of course, the, uh, the instructor and the TA the, the, uh, the two very, very supportive individuals within the course are there to help 
and to um, offer guiding questions, etc. as we go along. Katie, can you talk a little bit about uh, your experiences when you first were expo exposed to BBL and what it felt like for you? Uh, I think it felt for me how it feels for most of our students, which is very frustrating. Um, I equate the PBL learning style uh, environment when you come in as an outsider, somebody who's never experienced it before, um, an immigrant, so to say, to the, the learning environment, it feels very chaotic. You, you don't know the rules and you don't know the regulations and there aren't any and you feel very lost um, about where to start or where to begin. And as you move through the um, problem, course, material, however you want to call it, um, and you become more and more comfortable, it all of a sudden, it feels like an awakening. All of a sudden, you are in control. Um, your learning is going where you want it to go, and it's almost like you don't want to go back to your old way. Um, but initially, there's a learning curve to it, and I think that I, feel, I felt very much how a lot of our students feel, and hopefully they will come out of it feeling how I did near the end, which was, um, very proud of myself and very like a, an accomplishment that I had finally achieved as opposed to mastering um, you know what my teachers had already mastered. Okay can you, you respond to the, the whole idea of coming to the expectation of what the teacher wants you to learn and how are you supposed to know that? Can you respond to that at all? Like what, what goes on in PBL? Yeah. Well in PBL it, the teacher doesn't have uh, an end goal for you to learn, I feel. You you are going to take out of it what you need to know or need to learn or what's going to um, be of interest to you and, and guide you in your path. It's very individual learning um, as opposed to when you're in a regular setting and um, you know there's one outcome. I feel like in pedo uh, setting there are numerous correct paths to get to an end and that end is kind of you know learning occurs but the exact um, outcome is not predicted before it occurs it's not set in place um, it's something very individual so I don't think that there's anything that the teacher necessarily uh, I feel there are parameters of things that are going to be learned and mastered, but there's no one right answer. Right, and if you take a look at the course outline, the the outcomes really are fairly general. I, I've got a, a set of them here in front of me, and uh, we could talk about outcomes like identifying the major developments in the history of computing. Well, I'm not going to be asking you at any point in time to be able to give me a date and to identify a piece of hardware that was created or a piece of software or something along those lines. The idea is that you're going to be learning about the major developments in the history of computing as they pertain to your particular perspective and your experiences, etc. The, the same thing can be said about all of the learning outcomes as we go through. So this third question that, that Katie is really uh, responding to at this point in time, how can students create their own knowledge and still learn what needs to be learned? Well, what we are, the, the entire question hinges around this whole idea of what is to be learned. And you are being placed in the driver's seat to determine what it is that needs to be learned. It's not me who determines ahead of time as the instructor in this course what they, what standards that you need to come up to, but it's a means of being able to chart your progress, pr chart your growth, and that's one of the things that we're actually doing while we're using uh, Knowledge Forum to take a look at where did you start within this PBL process and where are you going to end up when we see your final presentations in 10 weeks time. I hope that uh, all of this is of uh, some value to you and I think we're getting to the point of just nudging the, uh, the 15 minutes that we actually have available with YouTube. So I think we're going to have to stop at this point in time. However, every third week or so we will be having similar kinds of conversations and we had hoped to actually have another uh, colleague come and join us but that didn't quite work out for today. So hopefully we, he can join us uh, for the next uh, time that we actually put these together. Thank you, and we'll talk to you again soon.